by uh, Professor uh, Luciano uh, Rizzola, and uh, his uh, uh, talk is the binary uh, neutrino star, how to model Einstein's uh, richest uh, lab laboratories. Uh, Professor uh, Rizzola, it's yours. Okay, very good. I'll try to share my uh, screen now. I hope you can all see my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Not yet. Yes, yes. Oh, you can see it. OK, so um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this, um, this uh, talk. Uh, it's actually neutron star, no neutrino. Um, there are also neutrinos, but they are mostly made of oh, neutrons. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure for me to be um, uh, giving this talk at this conference because, um, you know, 2020 may be the first time that Lattice Boltzmann has been applied to astrophysics. And uh, this means that maybe uh, when Sauro's next introductory uh, talk will be at the next conference, he can add a new act, act number six, to the saga of Lattice Boltzmann and start with 2020 when Lattice Boltzmann entered astrophysics. Anyway, so um, I'll be talking about um, one of the reasons why we think it's interesting and worthwhile to apply Lattice Boltzmann to uh, astrophysics and is to study binary neutron star, which I'll try to convince you is Einstein's richest laboratory. So um, I'll give you a, a short uh, plan of my talk. I will explain why um, the title, why I think that is such a rich, such a rich laboratory. I will try to give you a very short introduction to gravitational wave spectroscopy, so how you can understand um, the equation of state of neutron stars by looking at the gravitational wave signal. I will tell you a little bit about how you can handle magnetic fields and, and get an electromagnetic counterpart from neutron star mergers. And I will give you a hint about um, the possibility of probing the phase diagram of strong interaction matter um, if a quark hadron, in particular a hadron quark phase transition takes place. Something that I will not be able to tell because of shortness of time is um, you know, what happens to the mass that is ejected in binary neutron star mergers, or what is it that we have learned from the first event we've seen of such um, a merger, that is GW170817. Something I should alert you is that um, numerical relativity is a highly technical branch of physics, and I could just bog you down with details, uh, and I'm sure this would not be pleasant for you, nor for me. So I would stay away from details and technicalities, but there is a lot of technicalities. And if you are interested and curious about these technicalities, you just have to um, you know, ask questions at any time. I'd be glad to go into the deeper details. So having said that, the problem we want to solve is a two-body problem in general relativity. And um, because I am a theorist, I like to take a problem and make it into the, uh, the simplest possible description. You know, I want to have a spherical cow. And so I like to think of a binary problem as a, a scattering problem, where you have a, an initial state, which are two black holes, and you have a final state, which is another black hole. And in this scattering, um, you produce gravitational waves. So gravitational waves is a, the outcome of this product. And in particular, we're interested in, those, in that scattering where you are assigning linear momenta to your black holes such that they are in quasi-circular orbit. And then they will in spiral and will merge and produce a new black hole. And this is not just fantasy. This is something we see, OK? This is the first detection in 2015. And you know the type of waveform that uh, have been produced numerically were first calculated by people like me in 2006. Now, in the case of neutron stars, you can think this is, again, a scattering problem. You start with two neutron stars, and you end up with a black hole plus gravitational waves. But 
in between this, this sequence, there are two important things that happen. The first one is that you produce what we call a hypermassive neutron star, or HMNS. This is an object that cannot exist in nature, at least not through quasi-stationary transformations. You can produce it, but it's a metastable um, equilibrium. And so this object will want to collapse to produce a black hole. And because there is going to be some matter around it, you will produce what we call a torus. So a disk of matter around a black hole. And what I'm trying to uh, impress is that um, you know, these are the places where we have most of uncertainties in this phase and in this phase. But it's also where most likely there are the most interesting rewards, because if we can understand this phase, the hypermassive neutron star, then maybe we have a way of understanding what is the equation of state. For those of you who are not familiar with this, by equation of state, I generically mean how, what is the, the interior of neutron stars. We, we know roughly the mass, we know roughly the size, but we have no idea what's inside because, well, we have too many ideas about what's inside. As you can see, these are all the generate solutions about what, um, um, so this is a diagram where you show the mass versus the radius. And these are all possible um, nuclear physics outcomes. The other reason why we're interested is that if we understand this phase over here, then maybe there are chances to understand what happens in a short gamma ray burst. Short gamma ray burst that will explain our explosions in the universe, very bright, very luminous. We know they are associated with neutron stars, but we also know they produce a jet. And we have a very poor understanding of what produces this jet from uh, ab initio calculations. And then there is another aspect which is interesting in all of this story. So before you go into a blank hole plus gravitational waves, is that you eject matter. That's not very difficult to imagine. Um, after all, we're smashing two objects which are very massive at a fraction of the speed of light. And you can easily imagine that part of this matter will be so energetic, there's going to be a tail in the distribution of the energies, such that this matter will be unbound gravitationally, will leave the system. And this is actually very important because it's this matter that will undergo nucleosynthesis and produce what they are called heavy elements. So these are elements heavier than iron and you know the most precious elements that we are cherish so much like gold or platinum we think they are created in neutron star mergers it's not yet clear whether neutron stars mergers produce coins but they certainly produce gold okay um what are the equations we want to solve um after all we understand physics when we look at it in terms of equations so um is there a question? No. OK. All right. So the first set of equations we want to solve are the Einstein equation. These are the equations that tell me how the two neutron star move around. But then I also need to conserve energy and momentum and conserve rest mass. So I have conservation laws. And these may be equations you are not familiar with because I have a covariant derivative. And that's because I am in a generativistic context of our curved space time. I then have an equation of state that need, is needed to close the system. So in general, it's a prescription between the pressure, the density, the specific internal energy, the composition, you name it. On top of this, there are other equations that we need to solve. For instance, if there are electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields, then you need to add um, also conservation laws for these equations. So you have the Maxwell equations, again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a generativistic context. If you have radiative transfer, if you, you know, part of your energy lost through radiation, um, then you will need an additional equation over here. This is the equation that we want to solve and, and that we have solved in a special relativistic context. Daniele and Alessandro have already discussed yesterday and today how you do this in, uh, in a special relativistic context with LB methods. And at the end of the day, our energy momentum tensor here has to be seen as the linear combination of all the components. You might have an, a fluid component, an electromagnetic component, if you have electric, and uh, if you're doing a neutral hydrodynamics, a radiative component, and you know, it may have a scalar field and so on and so forth. So this is a set of equations, but we need very different methods to solve them. 
The Einstein's equations normally involve smooth fields, okay? Although you may have a, an energy momentum tensor which has discontinuity because the density is discontinuous, the metric is continuous and differentiable of second order. And so is the Ricci tensor. So in general, you are using smooth fields here. And this means that you need different methods than so when solving these other equations over here, which by definition allow for nonlinear waves and discontinuous waves like shocks. So the two methods are very different and we need to take them into account and make them march at the same time. So the way we do this, um, sorry, I didn't want to do that. The way we do this is, well, the Einstein's equation gives you a local solution of the curvature. They don't give you any an, a, idea of the topology of the full space time. And they are covariant. So you first have to find a proper set of coordinates that describes the solution. In, you know, in, in, in uh, Galilean physics, uh, even in special relativity, all of this is not problematic because you can easily, um, th th there is no um, problem with, with the coordinates. Well, you can still find better coordinates, you know, especially if you're doing relativistic aerodynamics, you may want to use coordinates which are best, best suited. But in general relativity, this is a must. And that is why we tend to split our space time in this manner, we have a three-dimensional hyperspace, and then we find a solution on one hyperspace, and we find a solution on the new hyperspace uh, through an evolution equation. And we need to take into account that, you know, time can change between one slice and the other, coordinates can change between one slice and the other, because coordinates may be distorted by presence of curvature. So all of this needs to be taken into account. So there is freedom in the coordinates, but it's essential that you use it, use the proper coordinates so you simply don't have any solution. The answers equation that I've shown you also are covariant, tensor covariant equation. That means you can write them in whatever coordinate system you want. And not necessarily the way you write them is hyperbolic. In fact, you know, we have banged our heads very hard against the wall before realizing that the formulation we were using, the ADM formulation, was weakly hyperbolic. And that's why all our codes crashed. Nowadays, we know, we learned the lesson, and we use hyperbolic formulations. In particular, we try to write the equations in a first-order system in time and possibly in space. So just to give you an idea, the typical set of equation we need to solve look like so. You have dt of a tensor, so this is a three by three tensor, gamma ij, this is a particular three metric. This is the extrinsic curvature, this is a traceless conformal extrinsic curvature. And then you have a, a complex right hand side where you have second order spatial derivative mixed of any type. And you have lots of these, okay? In fact, you know, the, the, the system we are now solving has 58 variables that we have to solve at every time. And this is just for the Einstein's equation. Okay, to tell you about the metric and the extrinsic curvature. Then you have to worry about other dynamics and MHD. And here we want to write them as conservation laws. So we want to write them as something like this. You have a DT of a fluid uh, state vector U, and this is proportional to the divergence of a flux vector Fi plus a source term. If you do this, then it's important because then you know you, you are taken to a well-posed mathematical problem. And we know that if you have a discontinuity, then you're going to converge to the correct weak solution of the problem. So this formulation is not necessarily in the case of the Einstein's equation. You've seen the Einstein's equation are, are not written in a conservative formulation. That's not important. But for the hydro and MHD, it is. And that's why we pay attention to this. So I don't know if this is going to work, but you know, you just invest um, 15 years of your career uh, solving this equation. You find fantastic students like Lucas Vai and Elias Moss and many others before them. And then you can build a code that does something like so. So this is, I don't know if you can see, can you see a movie? Yeah, we can see it. Yes, we see it. Yes, yes. Okay, so what you're seeing here are two neutron stars solutions, self-consistent solution of the generativistic aerodynamic equations. They are moving towards each other. At this point, they merge. They produce what is the hypermassive neutron star, which is this uh, 
oblate um, object that is losing angular momentum, emitting gravitational waves, and, is, and, and one point will become so compact, an horizon will be produced, and this is a black hole, and then you have all of this matter around. This is what I was telling you was um, the torus, okay? So this is a typical picture. In a merger, you will have the merger, you produce an hypermassive neutron star, and you produce a black hole plus torus. There are many different variants to this picture, but this is the basic picture. And you should not be fooled by the fact that this looks like a very tenuous fluid. Actually, this is a very heavy fluid. We're talking about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 gram per cubic centimeter. So, you know, a billion times more dense than water. So, if this is the right picture, you, you may ask, okay, what are the differences? What are the degrees of freedom? One is the total mass, okay? We don't know what is the mass of the system, but you can imagine that if you start with something which is very massive, then you produce an hypermassive neutral star which is very massive and would immediately collapse to a black hole. By immediately, I mean over a time scale of few milliseconds. By the way, millisecond is the time scale over which everything happens here. If the two stars are not very massive, then it may take a bit longer, maybe a second. But at the end, you always produce a black hole. Then there are mass asymmetries. In the simulation that I've shown you, the two stars are at the same mass, but this needs not to be the case. In fact, we know that you know, this is not the case, although the difference normally is very small, maybe 20% uh, no more. Then there are other um, um, aspects. This is the equation of state. As I said, we don't know what is the equation of state. And so we need to have a solution that is able to encompass all possibilities. We have magnetic fields. All of a sudden, this complicates our, our equations considerably, and so the description. And then, of course, we have radiative losses. This is the one place where LB would be ideal, and we've shown it is already very good in special relativity. The reason why we need to take into account radiative losses is that this is very heavy, very dense, and hot matter. This means that neutrinos are produced very abundantly. And these neutrinos have a very short scattering, very small scattering cross-section. And so they will leave the system. And when they leave the system, they take away energy and momentum and angular momentum. And so the system will change whether or not you have neutrinos in or neutrinos leaking. And right now we have codes that can handle all of these different aspects. Okay, so we have codes that can do all of these things together is the result of, as I said, of almost two decades of development in this direction. But um, thanks to, to the many collaborators and students, this is now possible. Let me first explain what is it that we can do nowadays, and I will explain how you can understand the equation of state by looking at the gravitational waveform. So at the end of the day, when we do a simulation, we don't produce a nice movie. Well, we do produce a nice movie. Lucas is very good at producing nice movies. But the real quantity that we want to provide our colleagues is this, is a gravitational waveform. You may have seen this already. Let me explain what you are seeing here. You have time here. You can see milliseconds in the time scale. This is the gravitational wave strain in one of the two polarization. And there is one part of the signal, which is called the chirp signal. This is because the amplitude grows and the frequency grows just like a bird who's chirping. Then there is a transient, um, which I can explain. But then there is the hypermassive neutron star, which is much easier to understand. This is when you have this object, which is now almost stationary, is rotating quietly, and is emitting gravitational waves. And then you produce a black hole. Okay, This is the ring down. In the ring down, the signal decays exponentially. It's, it's, it's the same as a bell that is ringing down. And so after that, there is just nothing. Now, if you want to compare um, neutron stars with black holes, black holes are shown over here. See, in the black hole, there is in spiral, and bang, there is the, new, the, the, the ring down. So in the case of neutron star, there is this portion here of the signal, which is new and is actually where there is a lot of information. Let me explain how you can get this information. So the very same picture I've shown you before um, in, in time can be seen in frequency. 
And in frequency, we like to think of a power spectral density, this quantity over here. So is the, is the power emitted in gravitational waves as a function of frequency. And so normally what you do is you start from here, low frequency, lot, lots of power. This is because the system spends a very long time in one single frequency in bin, and so you can emit a lot of power. But then you go down in this direction, generically, and then at one point there is a merger, and then there is a ring down. So this is what happens in the case of black holes. I'm here thinking this is a black hole system of 1.4 solar masses at a distance of 100 megaparsec, just to give you numbers. So you can see that it will go down, and it's going to be a little bump here. This is because at the very end, the system is highly nonlinear. You produce much more energy at the end than you were produced in the past, and then you have a ring down, the exponential decay. If you ask, well, how does a neutron star with the same mass differ? Well, you start again here, and this is because at low frequency, black holes and neutron stars are the same. They are point particles. You go down this way, and then because neutron stars have a given size, they will start having a different phase evolution, which means that in this plot, they will go along these blue lines, and, and they will merge at lower frequency. This is the merger. You see here, you're merging at about two kilohertz, in the case of black hole, you merge at six kilohertz. And then there is this complicated post-merger phase, which is, you know, looks like just noise. Actually, this is not rubbish. This is very precious information. And what we are trying to do in, in, in gravitational physics is not only tell the black from the blue, but also tell the blue from the blue, because there are two blue lines here, and these are two different equations of state. And we want to be able to tell the equation of state by just looking at this. You may think this is crazy, but it's not. Let me explain why. First, let me show you what we can do nowadays. Well, this is not nowadays, it's 2016. We can do pretty much the same. This plot is a very colorful plot that has taken one year of supercomputing time in Munich. And I can explain everything there is about it in less than a minute, well, maybe a minute. So. Different colors are different equations of state. And in particular, this is a soft equation of state, and these are this blue are stiff equation of state. Again, this is jargon. Stiff means you cannot compress the star very much, so it has a large radius. Soft means you can compress it, small radius. What you can see is that um, a soft equation of state has a post-merger signal, which is very small, if a small fraction of what is in the spiral. This is not the case for stiff equation state, where the size of the signal is comparable, maybe a factor half. And another thing you can appreciate that the frequency here is much higher than the frequency here. You can see that you can hardly distinguish the peaks here, while you can easily see the peaks over here. So stiff equation state give you a post-merger signal at low frequency, and vice versa, soft give you high frequency. You can also see there are beatings here because the system is very widely oscillating. The air is not very widely oscillating. And in between the red and the blue, there is almost a continuum. Okay, I don't think this was a minute, but pretty much this is all that there is to say. One point which is maybe I missed is, if you look here, this object is producing a black hole, while this object in 25 milliseconds is not producing any black hole. In fact, this object can resist maybe 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. And this is because it's emitting very little amount of gravitational waves, and so it's not losing angular momentum. This object is losing a lot of angular momentum, and so it will soon produce a black hole. If you understand this plot in time, and you Fourier transform with the back of your head, then you obtain the same representation in Fourier space. And I don't expect you to read this with any care, but what I would like you to, to concentrate is the fact that there are peaks, okay? So these are lines, and so that is why I call it gravitational wave spectroscopy, because you can do spectroscopy, you can study lines in a spectrum to understand the properties of the source. That's what, you know, spectroscopy is all about. So we can do gravitational wave spectroscopy, and if you are not convinced, let me explain how you actually do this. This is an equation of state, it's a stiff equation of state in time. You Fourier transform, you obtain this object over here. This dotted line represents the, the in spiral, so you can forget. You can imagine this line goes up in this direction. Um, 
the Fourier transform has one peak, another peak, and then another peak, okay? It doesn't take a, a genius to find out that this largest peak must be this period of the emission where you have an almost constant frequency. And in fact, it's very easy to show. So what we call F2 is essentially the signal over this period, and these two sidebands, F1 and F3, they are produced during this time over here when the system is still settling down. I, I can explain how, but it doesn't matter here. So now I change the equation of state. I use a soft equation of state. As you can see, everything is different. It's the red, you know, both in the spiral and in the post-merger. If you look at the spectrum, you, it's all different. However, you can see that you still find an F2, you can still find an F1, and you can still find an F3. And this is what is important. There are features that are universal, that do not change uh, with the equation of state. They are changing in position. And that is why a lot of work, you can see all the names that have been listed here, has gone into mapping the position of this curve, of these peaks, into some knowledge of the, of, of the properties of the equation of state. So we now know that there is a universal behavior Okay, and you can actually do an analytic modeling of the post-merger signal, okay? The very complicated signal I was showing before, well, you can do analytically now because we know how to place those peaks. And then you can ask yourself, um, well, suppose that I see N detections, what is it that I will learn on the radius of the star? How, how narrow can I make the error or the uncertainty on the radius? I guess this exercise tells you that, you know, a theorist is an incurable optimist. We haven't seen any of these post-merger detection. I'm already telling you what you will learn if you will see uh, 20 or 50 or 100. To make a long story short, as is shown in this plot, where you have the average radius. So this is a large average radius of stiff equation of state, soft equation of state, and this is the... Uh, uncertainty in the radius, delta R over R in percentage, and different shadings here tell you, you know, what is the error if you do, if you observe 20, 50, or 100. And I try to summarize everything here. Essentially, you know, with 10 detections, you will already know whether the equation of state is stiff or soft. Right now, we don't know. With, uh, with 20, if the equation of state is stiff, with 20, then you will have an error which is less than 10%. Right now, we have an error which is almost 20%. And if the equation is soft, you will need more equations, more detection. Okay, you see the error here is much harder to, to, to beat. And if we are very, very lucky and we get a signal to noise ratio about 6 at 30 megaparsec, the standard distance is 100 megaparsec or more, then a single detection, because it's so loud, will be able to give you delta R over R with 2% and 90% confidence level. Okay, I want to now handle the issue of what happens if you have um, 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 magnetic fields, okay? So the reason why I need magnetic fields is because I really want to understand what is a gamma ray burst. And we know that there are gamma ray bursts because already since the 70s, we, we've seen them. We, we see one a day, essentially. And these are huge explosions. We can see them far away in the universe. They are the most red-shifted objects. So the farthest away we can see, there are two families, long and short. Um, the long are tens of seconds. The short are a second or less. And the long ones, we think they are due to collapse of very massive star that produce black hole, while in the short, we are now sure, have to do with, uh, with neutron star binaries. We also know from the observations, so this is a, a, an inference from the observation, that there must be a jet produced, a, a non-relativistic outflow of the type that uh, Alessandro was discussing this morning. But how do you produce a jet? You know, you take two stars, you, you merge them, and you, how do you produce a jet? Okay, so this is a question that, uh, you know, if you, if you ask an astrophysicist, we'll tell you, well, you need magnetic fields. And so that's what we do. We, we introduce magnetic fields, and we go from hydrodynamics to MHD in addition to Einstein's equation. So this is shown you in another movie, which I'll play now. But before I play it, um, 
I'm showing you density here with this color code and magnetic field with this other color code. And these are two scalar quantities because I'm showing the norm of the magnetic field. If I plot them on top of each other, you wouldn't see anything. You would just see a lot of colors. So you have to imagine that there is a wall here. And on one side of the wall, I'll show you one quantity. And on the other side, I'll show you the other quantities. I hope the movie is playing. And you can see how I'm just you know, painting uh, the stars with different quantities as they go through this wall. So now they merge. They produce an outflow, a very powerful, almost at the speed of light outflow, very low density, very hot matter. And at this point, I don't know if you can see, there is a black hole being produced, OK? So if you look at it up until this point, nothing really has changed. This is shown in these uh, stills. You see, these are the magnetic fields initially. This is at the merger. Then there is a big mess when there is the hypermassive neutron star. You just lose completely the memory of the magnetic field. And uh, you know whatever it was your initial field is completely destroyed. However, you can continue these simulations further. Um, and what happens is quite interesting. Essentially, you have that a lot of, there is a lot of material here that has very little angular momentum. And so the only thing it can do is actually fall into the black hole. This is ideal MHD. So you, you carry your magnetic field with you. You add back to your magnetic field. At the same time, you are shearing magnetic field here. So you see that now the, the, the magnetic field has grown to a very large amplitude as it can become white. And so out of the actual color code. So this is where the simulation ends. You can look at the stills at this point. And you can see that as a black hole is formed, there is still a lot of complicated field topology. But then you know, the black hole is setting an order. After all, this is a rotating black hole. And if you wait long enough, you produce this object, which is a jet-like uh, structure. Now, if you look at the, at the typical energetics, you produce a black hole with spin 0.8, with a, a mass of about six solar masses, so 6% of a solar mass. If you calculate how long will it, this torus resist, it's about 0.3 seconds. So this is not a gamma ray burst uh, simulation in any respect, but it's just telling you that if you want to have a jet, then collide two neutron stars with a magnetic field, and then naturally you will have the production of strong magnetic fields and a jet structure. Other groups have since done similar simulations, and they see very similar uh, results. And overall, there is an agreement in the literature that magnetic fields in neutron stars do the trick. We still don't know how to produce an, an outflow. And this is because we're probably missing a lot of microphysics. And this is where getting neutrino transfer is so important. But we're not there yet. I don't know how much time I still have. You can have uh, another seven minutes, if you like. OK, perfect. In these seven minutes, I, <laughs> I will try and touch about another aspect which has been very topical over the last few weeks and months, which is phase transition, OK? So I, I work in the Institute of Theoretical Physics, where there are lots of people doing heavy ion collisions. So most of my colleagues talk about heavy ion collisions all the time, and phase diagram and QCD. So they like to think of life and the universe in this, you know, in this phase diagram. You have temperature, you have biochemical potential, this is the early universe, very low baryon chemical potential, very high temperatures. This is our neutron stars, very low temperatures, very high baryon chemical potential. And this is where, you know, lattice QCD calculations make their, calc they, 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 they tests. This is where you can do low energy heavy ion collisions. This is where neutron star mergers can, can probe this, this uh, part of the phase diagram. And as you can see, there is nothing here. There, Lattice QCD cannot give any prediction here. Experiments cannot give you any prediction. So neutron stars are a way to look into this part of the, of the phase diagram. And actually, what they do is they enter this phase diagram and leave a track. This is shown over here. You have to think that a, a system, binary neutron star system, produces a, a merger remnant that itself is changing temperature and density, in particular, 
the density will grow like so, the temperature will grow like so. So you can imagine that at one point, if there is a phase transition, you will cross the boundary with a phase transition, say this boundary over here. And if there is a phase transition, you will see it. So this is shown in this other beautiful movie that Luca Vai has produced. I hope this will run. So again, you see two stars. These are now fully hadronic stars. There is not a single inch of quarks. They get closer to each other and they will merge producing an upper mass neutron star, pretty much like I was mentioning before. There is a lot of physics happening right now. There is a shearing layer uh, and a Kelvin almost instability that develops. You've probably seen a little bit of that. Now, this object will increase its density and temperature. And, and in doing so, it will produce a quark phase, which is now shown with this green shaded area. Okay, so that is now a core of pure quark matter that is inside the star. And because of this phase transition, the star also has changed considerably the, its shape. You see, it is no longer a peanut, it is, is a very um, highly distorted object, which is losing angular momentum. And you know, if you wait long enough, this object will produce a black hole. So once again, we're not gonna be producing movies. What we need, the only quantity that we receive on Earth is gravitational waves. So we have to tell how we can read this from the gravitational waves. So the easiest way to explain this is by looking at the frequency of the gravitational wave. It will look like so. This is a typical fully hadronic, that is no phase transition spectrogram. Okay, this is when LIGO shows you the spectrogram, shows you a banana that comes like this. Okay, normally they stop here because they cannot go past the merge. It's too high frequency. So you, uh, they actually stop even a, a, a lower frequency. Okay, but this thing at one point reaches the the, the, the f two frequency, and so you have the um, the f two mode, which is left into the signal. Okay, don't forget this is um, a spectrogram. So frequency is here, and time is here. There are no numbers because it is a cartoon. But you are thinking about here. Yeah, you're looking at three kilohertz or so. Now. What, what you can do is you can have a phase transition right at the merger, okay? And then you produce something which is now oscillating at a different frequency. You can produce a signal where you start producing a phase transition. A phase transition happens here, and then this object produces a black hole. How do I know it's a black hole? Because of the frequency divergence. Or, and this is the fourth case we have considered, there is a delayed phase transition. So you start with an hadronic star, but then the amount of quark increases in the core, and then you find a new equilibrium. So this orange line is actually what I've shown you in the movie. Okay, this is what we have produced. Um, this is what it will look like if you if you go there and measure the central density. Um, so the central density will have a threshold for a pure quark phase. A threshold for a mixed phase, whether you're going to have uh, a mixture of quarks and hadrons co coexisting, or you have never uh, quarks and you have a pure hadron phase. And as you can see, these are essentially the three, the four different cases I was mentioning. As I was highlighting, really what we see is the gravitational wave. So now I'm, I'm plotting you the four cases I was mentioning. So this is the plain vanilla, never a phase transition, okay? Um, and uh, this is instead the delayed phase transition. You can see we start with a given frequency and then we move on to the another frequency. And this is the phase transition uh, induced collapse where you go from here and then you have a jump and you produce a black hole. You can see there is a black hole here. It's the only one having a black hole. These other guys do not have a black hole. So I want, don't want to run out of time. Let me give you my conclusions. I. I I hope that I, you know, illustrate a little bit more about what neutron stars are about. I've shown you that the post-merger has peaks and these are quasi-universal. If you use this with tens of observations, you can get the radius with about a kilometer precision. If you merge binaries with the magnetic fields, you can produce jet structures. And, and maybe you can explain short gamma ray burst. 
And last but not least, I've explained that if there is a phase transition after the merger, this will give you signatures. And so all of a sudden we have another way of entering the phase diagram and checking whether quark matter can be produced in the universe. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, we can probably take a couple of questions. Uh, yes, this is Saro speaking, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I have a couple of questions, but maybe just one. First of all, thank you so much, Luciano. This was really impressive and very, very fascinating. Uh, the question, the first question is very technical. I didn't quite understand why lattice QCD is helpless in the region of the phase diagram where the neutral star is. Is that uh, just lack of compute power or is more fundamental? No, it's, it's, it's a more fundamental problem. It's called the sign problem. And essentially when you go with mu different from zero, you have that many of the integrals that are needed to be integrated are widely oscillating. So essentially the integral oh. is a cancellation of two large integrals which are almost the same. Yeah, and this is very important. Problem. Yeah. I see. So it's the same problem is hitting even there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, interesting. And the second question is very naive. Uh, since you talked about, uh, you know, uh, testing uh, the formation of quark outside the accelerators. Uh, it seems to me that what the accelerators are very much after these days is dark matter. And is there any connection to dark matter in your work or potential or future or is it a nonsensical question? And the same question. So, it is a, a sensical question. Um, it is an exotic question though. Um, so. People are looking to this, uh, and the idea is, okay, neutron stars are dense objects. If there is dark matter, they will concentrate dark matter in their cores, simply because the gravity is so strong. And if you have a star which is swimming in a bath of dark matter, this will naturally concentrate. And so you may think that there is a dark matter core inside a star, and what happens to this dark matter core when the two stars merge? So there are some first simulations that uh, explore this. And there is obviously a, a signature, right? And it, uh, it's not very difficult to imagine why. This core is very weakly coupled. In fact, it's coupled only gravitationally to the, uh, to, the, to the star. So imagine a star with a core of dark matter. If it is sta stationary, it doesn't do anything. But then move the star the dark matter core will trail behind it just because it's trying always to catch up. And this changes the gravitational wave signal. And so in principle, it is a question that people are addressing and uh, we are also thinking about this. Okay, thank you so much, Lucian. That was great. All right, so any uh, more questions? I have a question. Yeah. Luciano, thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. It's amazing to see what is possible nowadays in terms of simulations. Uh, if I remember correctly, you said there are more than 40 observables in your coupled differential equations, right? And um, of course, you solve this problem numerically, which means you need boundary conditions at um, uh, the, the boundaries of your domain. And since you also generate gravitational waves, I wonder, do you have any problems with um, reflections at the boundaries? So how do you have to treat the boundary conditions to get a good signal? Okay, so, um, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, and of course we have problems, all sorts of problems. Um, now, the, the number of fields I have to evolve is more than, 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 than that. It's, you know, if I use a first order system, it's 58 just for the, uh, space time and then I have you know hydro variables so another uh, I don't know eight nine variables so in the case of hydro it's easy right everything has to go out and so you use outgoing boundary conditions and that most of the time works fine for the field equation you don't really know because you know uh, wave equations are mathematically well defined as spatial infinity and you are never going to cover spatial infinity certainly not with our choice of coordinates so what you try to do is you put your boundary as far away as possible. And in this way, you try to minimize the amount of reflection. Having said that, you don't have just reflection at the outer boundary. We have reflections also at boundary between refinement levels. A lot of our quantities behave like 
you know, wave equations. And so, um, especially violations of the constraints are moving like waves, and this will have a poor transmission across boundaries of different refinement levels. And these normally introduce small oscillations, which we try to cope with by introducing some cryis oligo type of dissipation in our wide end side to keep them under control. So, you know, these are all problems that, that, uh, that, that plague us, but of course, you know, we try to make sure that we are always convergent and if we introduce dissipation, this is convergent more rapidly than, than any other truncation error that we have. And uh, we, you know, we check that the, the gravitational waves we extract have the right properties. So, you know, in, in, in general activity, you can make sure that certain invariants are satisfied by the gravitational waves and we check that this is the case. So there is a lot, as, as I said, there is a high level of sophistication in how you do this. And um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. OK, so let's uh, uh, thank the speaker again. And uh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And I think we could uh, split into uh, session five and six. So uh, 